questions? Like a charm before. Okay. Now it works. Great. Great. Yeah, thank you for, for having me here. Um, I thought I'll present some uh, combination of some data we generate and also the analytical questions. So I hope I, I have something interesting for, 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 for the breadth of the audience um, in different areas. Before I get into the actual topic, which is actually quite related to what David was presenting, I want to also just sort of motivate a few sort of tools we're using as a backbone that I'll, I'll need to, to start out with. So we have a very strong interest in obviously leveraging different technologies, you know, that drive novel methodologies. I'm not going to talk about spatial access today, although that would be uh, also very interesting interest for us. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, using multi-omic data in, in also in the context of spatial and temporal covariate, like here as an example, triple omic sequencing, where we measure multiple omics layers from the same cells. And, and, and the reason is that there's sort of two elements that we took away from this that also in, in the remainder of my presentation be very useful. Um, the first is it, it's been turned out very important and, and also sort of complicated and something I think we sometimes also underestimate sort of to sort of the engineering, you know, to align different oh. matrices of um, RNA and attack profiles from, you know, later on, I'll talk later with hundreds of samples um, and, and putting these together. And we've been um, engaging in these activities and also thinking about the software infrastructure. And I think it would be also, it's quite a useful exercise to think about how to do this as a community. There's maybe this consortium SEverse or for the Python users, you might want to take a look at, at that, um, that we sit with others to make these things interoperable. The other side I want to quickly mention, because I will use this quite extensively, is, is factorizations of data. Um, I'm not going to say much. I think it has been mentioned in several talks, but at several occasions, I will also, you know, use now tools where we co-factorize using group fact analysis, multiple omics modalities that we have observed in parallel here, for example, using the example that we have, you know, methylation transcriptome accessibility from the same cells. And, and the core, what I'm going to care about for this talk is really this latent representation that's shared, that we map these cells in a, in a latent space, you know, of factors that we're gonna, you know, use in quite a bit in this. And I'm happy also to discuss offline. There's, there's I think, quite exciting questions also how we incorporate spatial and temporal covariate, these types of approaches. Um, but that's not for this talk. What I really wanna focus on is, you know, um, a sort of technology that came our way um, a few years ago that really enabled scaling single cell sequencing to generating data from hundreds of people and, and what we can do with that. And that actually uh, sparked a lot of interest because it's actually why we got engaged in the field uh, because it allows us addressing questions in, in human genetics. And I have also a few slides of background why this question is of relevance and then uh, what approaches we've been taking to, to tackle them. And so the, the real motivator is maybe represented by this slide. This is a picture from the GVAS catalog. And you know, these different structures here, are human chromosomes, every dot here is a, a disease or phenotypic trait we've been mapped to heritable variants in our genome. I guess most of you are familiar with this type of representation. So we essentially have mappings between variants and disease traits of all sorts that can be as benign as earbox type or eye color or disease risk for something you really don't want to have in advanced age. And what we now really want to do is figure out what are the molecular intermediates that sit causally ideally between variant and phenotype and mediate or mitigate that signal and then also confer targets for intervention and, and ultimately develop treatments. And I use this picture to represent this problem that I, I hope will, will help to get us here on the same page. So on the right-hand side here, variant to phenotype, that's actually what genome modernization studies do. For example, quotes like UK Biobank, I'm not gonna really talk about this here, but the key is we need hundreds of thousands of samples and these associations are plus minus, you know, persistent, robust. There's a bit of G by E, but it's, it's you know, you can, it's a regression problem we can, we can well understand and linking variants to phenotypes. And um, what I want to focus on is the other side of this diagram, which is linking these variants to molecular readouts, like expression changes of genes. And that has a positive and a negative aspect to it. The positive is we can do this in much smaller cohorts. So hundreds of people is often enough. And the reason is that these molecular effects on expenditures and gene expression are much stronger. You, know, you have a lot more power to detect those changes. So that's the good news. The bad news is that this association is incredibly inrobust in the sense of it really depends on which cell type, cell states you're measuring them. You need to find the right cell type, the right time development to look at this. I'm having here this bio, the diagram from the um, uh, lifetime white paper, which I quite like. It sort of shows that we really want to look at 
using single cell assays where in live or trajectory cells mitigate and propagate and you need to at the right time basically assess this association yeah um, and and that is um, uh, quite a challenge in figuring out how you go from variant to expression and, and how to look at that so this is uh, where single cell assays come in i'm talking just like a few more slides about data before i can come to the model um, so we combined ips derived models where we take ips cells differentiate them to different lineages i'm talking about neurons in this case here and on the other hand, single cell sequencing that really allows you to capture this complexity of cell types as they emerge. And that we then can understand, you know, how do these variations in our genome then link to expression changes? And then we can also go back all the way to disease variants at the end. So um, a few years ago, we, we, we set this up with, um, with uh, 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 um, Florian Merkler and Daniel Gaffney, the Sanger in Cambridge. And the approach we took, we took 215 people and um, so this is the diversity of individuals from which we had IPS cell lines. So it's not a super large end, but substantial. Uh, and we created pools of human IPS cell lines. And I, I mentioned this pooling here will become later on. I hope I can close the loop in time. Um, and basically what this experiment conducts are just 10 pools of 20 lines each. So this whole data set are 10 different stations. Uh, that's exciting because you obviously can do this very efficiently. We differentiate these pools towards this neuronal fate. Details don't really matter, but we collect cells at day 11, 30, and 52, and then collect the quite substantial data sets of a million cells or something like that, that we can look at. So one note about pooling. I think many of you here in the single cell field be using this um, in, in different contexts. In a way, the pooling is, 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 in our case, straightforwardly resolved because these lines are genetically diverse. So you can assay variants in your single cell RNA-seq data. These data are extremely sparse, but given that any one of a pair of lines is roughly 10,000 variants segregating between, there's more than enough information. Now you find these 10, 20 variants that allow you to say, oh yeah, this cell comes from this guy, this cell comes from this guy. So you can resolve that. And, and there's also work from, from Jimmy Yee and others have been pioneering pooling methods um, in this context. I also wanna mention that this is great on the one hand because you get more throughput and lower batch effects. But there's a downside, which you create very uneven representations of samples. You don't get the same numbers of cells from each individual. That's something to deal with in the analysis downstream. So this is the data we, we, we're getting. So we're starting with these blue guys here. These are progenitor cells. Then here, there are neurons appearing, these green populations which we care about in the end. Um, and they also actually mature. But I want to emphasize that of subtle changes of how cells change across differentiation. Um, and that's something I want to come back to later. What is actually a neuron? Um, and what are these cell types? And is, is, it, is it sensible to cluster these cells discreetly? But for, for this purpose, we're doing this. There's many questions we could offer this. I just want to mention two major insights that we took away from this. The first is, and that's exactly, uh, it's quite important for downstream questions, is actually not all these lines make neurons in the same way. There are some lines that basically barely make any, 20% efficiency in a way, while others make them at high uh, proportions. Uh, but that's not for this talk. What I really want to focus on, but there is a connection, is that we can use this data and then map genetic effects. So here, these green populations, for example, here, these are dopamine neuron neurons. And what we're, and these guys here are serotogenic neurons. And what I'm showing here is just sort of a stereotypical example how we map these QTLs as expression level of a particular gene. And now what we essentially do is, in this population here, pseudobulk or aggregate across all cells from one particular individual. So every dot here in this, in, this, in this cartoon is a person, is a line, and asking whether those individuals carry a particular allele change in expression. And here you can see a presence of an association or absence of association in a different case. Um, there's one detail that I want to mention um, that is quite important. That's exactly caused by this unequal sampling. So what we are doing, and I come to that later on a little bit more detail, is actually fitting random effect models where we really account explicitly for the fact that one, we have multiple repeat lines from the same person. That's the one relatedness you need to account for. And the second is that you have a lot less information about these guys than these guys. So really your, your noise properties are extremely skewed. Yeah? You need to really think about what, what properties you actually measure and what, what you don't measure. And this is a, this is a really, that's the, that's the price to pay from pooling, from pooling many lines. And I, I want to just sort of show you one example here, you know, for those who, who care about the sort of downstream biological implication, we can actually find a number of interesting co-localization events. Here's one hit for schizophrenia. So these are variants, risk for schizophrenic outcomes later in life. And the same pool of variants that are here downstream of this gene SFX in five 
are also associated with expression changes with uh, statistical evidence for co-localization in our data in this particular condition. For example, they don't show up in GTEx. So you can really drill in really this very fine defined cell subtype, understand what is going on. So far so good. So what's the statistical question? Well, Anna and Tobias in the lab, they thought about this problem. And you know what I talked about essentially is solving lots of regression problems. We wanna fit association between variance and expression. And you know, we a non-zero slope is all we care about in, in molecular genetics. Um, and we can do this across cell types. For example, cell type A, cell type B, and there is a slope that changes, and you know that might hint towards an interaction effect that here cell type modulates the way genetics controls gene expression. Now the challenge is this requires a definition of cell type, and this is at least in our data not so well defined. And what we really would like to get at is actually a regression problem where every cell has its slope. We would like to assess genetic effects in each single cell, because then we don't have defined cell types. Now, I could ask, how does variance in the germline genome affect gene expression in cell one to N? The problem with this model is it's, it's not well defined because it has as many parameters as data points. And so the trick that um, uh, Anna and Tobias came up with is to say, well, you know, let's capture um, the similarity between these different cells on the transcriptome level using a a similarity metric, we fit a covariance-based model. I'll show you later how that works. It basically captures how similar they are. You know, that actually includes a special case of discrete stuff. So discrete would be two blocks. These guys are all group A, these guys are all group B. So you can capture the discrete nature, but you can obviously encode any other arbitrary um, um, specializations as well. And this leads us to fit a very simple, embarrassingly simple linear model, where we now take a vector, which is the single cell expression value. So this is the expression level of a particular gene across all cells. There's an additive effect that basically says, you know, these are these, these X vectors, the genotypes of the individuals where these cells come from. And that's basically just an additive effect that's regardless of cell type, cell state. And there's an additional component where we now have one effect size as a dot-wise product for every single cell. And as mentioned before, this is not identifiable because you have as many parameters in this uh, model as you can easily see as your data points. Now, the way to make it interpretable or uh, identifiable is to put a multivariate normal prior on this gamma matrix that exactly comes from this covariance I mentioned before. And it essentially ties together the effective degrees of freedom. Yeah? If you have a block structure, you would have only two possible values, but you can encode arbitrary assumptions about sharing or similarity between effect sizes across cells. And um, there is a, the way we estimate the sigma is actually we use a matrix equation with single cell anti-seq. So we fit one of these sparse factors models and use a couple of factors. That's important because it creates a low rank covariance. If this guy is low rank, the problem becomes tractable even for tens of thousands of cells. Otherwise, you, you're faced with inverting a very, very big matrix, which is in practice not possible. And we also control for repeat structure. So we include this relatedness component. There's another random effect matrix that accounts for the fact that multiple cells observed from the same person. That's also an important factor because otherwise you have double counting on this space. And we can do efficient inference by exploiting the low rank structure of this. I'm not gonna go into detail, but you know, it's basically low rank covariance matrix that you can invert efficiently and, and, and deal with that. And this is just to um, show that this uh, works compared to other methods. So what we're showing here is basically our approach in blue. And what we're looking at is power for recovering these interactions. So interactions is really this component, non-zero interaction effects between genetics and cell state. Um, and what I'm showing you here is on the one hand, you know, the variance explains the more, the more variance you have, the more power, that's easy. But what's very interesting is basically how many environmental factors or what these individual ranks that make up a covariance matrix really explain G by C in the simulation. And the comparison partner is just fitting a simple linear interaction model where you test one factor at a time you know, as a conventional interaction test, which obviously really suffers from a multiple testing problem on the one hand that you, you test more and more environments and you really see that you gain power, particularly for complex interactions when you have many, many environments that, 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 that drive that signal. So that's that also matter in practice. Here's one example. So I'm talking, focusing now just on these neurons, these dopaminergic neurons, just this subpopulation here that we lumped previously all together, you know, although they were originated from different days of different session with and without treatment. So it's clearly some substructure going on here, biologically speaking. And with the first thing we asked is basically, does this continuous modeling help? And what I'm comparing here is basically just using these low rank composition of cell states for finding interactions 
the resolution is a little bit poor, but it's on the x axis versus you know discretizing data. So the first is I just use these three conditions, and then we just use clustering, nine clusters, 18 clusters, and and, and, and so forth. So basically just discretizing your data in different groups and doing a pairwise standard test. And what's I think quite nicely to see is you really get more power by using this continuous modeling actually quite a bit. And you know, if you discretize, even if you overcluster data heavily, you only get a fraction of, of those discoveries. So the same results we see in simulations also hold on real data. And the reason really being that even if you discretize, you don't capture really the sharing or similarity between these different clusters. Yeah? You assume that they're all independent, which obviously doesn't really hold. There's sort of shared reflects in, in, in across those. And I just also want to show you a little bit about how this works in practice. So these are four EQTL genes. And what I'm showing here in color is not the expression level of these genes, but the estimated effect sizes. So this model estimates in every single cell a genetic effect size. And again, that's basically done by sharing pool information across all other cells. So there are strong assumptions inherent that's important to realize. But essentially, we can really see that you know, there are some um, effects that sort of look at particular subpopulations of cells in other EQTLs of other subpopulations of cells, although these are all the same cell type, all dopamine neurons and, and going forward. And actually if we cluster genes by their effect size profiles, we discover a number of regular pair patterns. If for example, here is a number of, of, of regulatory variants that are only active in this top population, others only this tiny population at the bottom and so forth. So I think there's, there's, there's really strong evidence that you need to look at the right cellular subset and cell type to look at regulatory variants. That is definitely not just one effect that you can lump together. I want to um, close this part by just making uh, one uh, tentative, and this is this is sort of early days observation that is also matters for disease variants. So, for example, if you look at um, co-localization with sleeplessness, insomnia. This is another GBAS hit. You can really see that you only actually find overlaps with EQTL associations if you look at this subpopulation that actually comes out from 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 our model-based approach. So, this also I think really matters for for annotating disease variants in going forward. Okay, so let me sum up this part. I think I tried to convince you of two um, pieces. The one is that population scale single cell sequencing is a, is a useful tool. Um, and we can particularly using pooling really scale this to really look at hundreds of people. And I think that's, there's, there's much more in this space. And um, I've also shown you one idea how we can really use the full data set to model effects at single cell type. We, we have to be sharing the actually interesting questions also about double dipping in this. I'm happy to discuss that offline or in questions. Um, uh, but it really allows you to share effect sizes and statistical evidence across cells, and you can mitigate the definition of cell types. I think it's quite interesting because if you think about cell types being defined by function, you could even argue that you really want to cluster cells based on these genetic effect size profiles to define what cell types are rather than on their distance on, on some on some UMAP or TSNE plot. I think that's a, that's an uh, interesting direction to, to go into. I would like to take a few more minutes to just tell you what we're doing now. And I'm, actually, this is early days for us, and I'm very excited to hear your thoughts. What we are now interested in is, you know, I talked about variant to gene, and this is something we can do, you know, using natural genetic variation that we explore. These are typically small effects. And what's on the next question is how we can we get the downstream players in these networks? How do we get the, the effects downstream pathways and so forth? And, you know, in other words, trans effects of, of these variants and, you know, mapping trans effects is notoriously difficult using population data. So what we are now doing is essentially combining these ideas of pooling. This is joined with Leo Park, the Sanger, of pooled iPS cell lines with CRISPR perturbation. So we're now looking at 26 donors. That's roughly what we have right now, 34 lines. So these are multiple lines from the same person. Um, and we then combine these different lines with um, 7,000 plus targeted CRISPR I perturbations that all have either moderate or strong effect on phenotypes. So they, they have phenotypic effects. And then we sequence those at different days of, of after perturbation stimulus, depending on effect sizes. But what's really important is in the end, what we get is a matrix where every row is a cell. And for each of these cells, we know now which donor these transcriptome profiles come from. But we also know the presence or absence of a perturbation state. Yeah? So you can really now start tingling together you know, donor of origin effects and variation that's present in the population with obviously the effect of, of this CRISPR-I perturbations. And there's a number of interesting modeling questions that one can tackle on. Think about what, what do you get from these designs? Yeah? And you know, I just want to show you two examples. The one is because it's genome scale, we can actually look at how similar are two targets. If we knock out two genes, then we can ask, you know, what's the sharing between target effect profiles? Because we have 
thousands of those. And what we're seeing in, in, at the moment is that many of these actually similarity between two phenotypic effects of two knockouts is driven by protein complexes. So it's very, very strong structure about uh, co-complex membership. Those genes which behave similar, if you knock them out, they share co-complex memberships, which is, I think, something that's partially known, but we cannot really look at this in iPS cells at scale. And there's also lots of interesting gaps where there's no known complex membership reason that we can look into. What I'm more excited about is the fact that we can use these multiple donors. So if we look at the UMAP of this data, the core structure is actually line. So there's strong donor effects. Remember, although these are pooled. And so these line effects are actually stronger than the, than the in individual perturbations, these CRISPR perturbations. And this leads us to thinking about, you know, re reactivating old ideas we had um, quite a few years ago, actually really following up on, on David's talk to think about whether we can exploit these multiple donor components to, to fit graphical models using, you know, building on independent causal mechanism principles. So the key core idea being that, you know, the, the causal graphs should be invariant across these different people. And whether we can use that because we basically have in a very controlled condition now data for many, many, many individuals. And we can look at whether we can look at this invariance and something that kind of lab has been following up. And it's actually something we quite a few years ago discovered in, in other contexts in yeast that basically invariance to different contexts, stimulus and other elements really helps for causation way before this was statistically established. Um, uh, this is, I think, a very useful principle to think about when we, when we type of modeling this data, these, these invariances. And the moment we are we're doing this is by, by fitting um, uh, causal graphs that explain variation in individual nodes, which are genes by parents. Um, if we have a regularizer that basically accounts for this, this, the, the graph structure, which we, which we, which we uh, relax using an L1 constraint to optimize over possible DAGs. And then we can obviously also include intervention effects because if you intervene at a particular variable, you break the, the causal independence uh, assumptions. And there's, there's interesting, interesting results to that. The moment we, you know, we get graphs out of that, what we're moment doing is we're taking these ICM inferences and taking the next experiments to validate you know, whether these things are real, which I, I can't show results for, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting approach to think about how we can use these invariances for causal discovery. And maybe that's a, a contribution for the next coffee break. And with this, I want to end here. Uh, I think I acknowledge people along the way, but um, obviously really I want to thank primarily the, the whole lab collaborators I think I acknowledged Dan Gaffney and Flora Merkler for the IPS work and Leopold Parts for this perturbation work at the end. And with this, I thank you and take questions. Thank you very much, Oliver. So are there any questions? Fascinating, Oliver. Um, so coming back to this uneven representation in the pools, do you worry about donors having very different number of cells? Um, and if so, you know, what are some of the practical things you are doing to adjust for that? Yeah, I mean, uh, your question is, is well posed. I think pools are a really fascinating uh, tool, but they have issues. So this is one pool that we followed over time. Every line here is a is a donor in the pool. And what you can see, they, you know, we don't even start balanced. That's something to be aware of. We just pool um, for maximizing throughput. Um, but you can see that here, in this case, two lines outgrow all the others. Um, and that's something um, that we see routinely. We are just completely accepting it. What's something that was very interesting for us to observe, I mentioned that some lines more or less efficiently create these neurons at the end. And so the relative cell type proportions, they don't care about pooling. So if we plot at the end stage, day 52, what fraction of the cells from each donor are neuronal, that doesn't really matter whether you differentiate them independently or in a pool. Yeah. And that's very important for our purposes for looking at cell intrinsic properties. And many of the properties, gene regulation are very cell intrinsic. And apparently in this case, even this sort of differences in outcomes pooling is, is, is fine and, and quite robustly observed. But I would agree in other cases, it, it might make, make a difference. What we do in practice in terms of dealing with this number is really account and propagate errors. So whatever you do, you basically have a huge additional error source that's simply driven by cell count. And it depends on what model you do. If you account-based model, you really deal with this normally. I think there's actually a beautiful example where account-based models make a big difference. Uh, because you get so much differential sort of signal to noise ratio in different observations. Um, you can also use other simple approximations. It turns out if you just use a multivariate normal and 
have a diagonal error covariance matrix and scale them with one over square root of n, the numbers of cells, you get almost the same result, which I think is sort of, you know, similar to this sort of lima womb type ideas that you can, you know, work in an approximate Gaussian space if you account for different residual variances. But that's how you have to do that. And, and that's the price to pay, but you know, you get increased throughput. Yeah, Andrew, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, really interesting talk. So sorry if I missed the beginning. Um, are you looking only at annotated kind of common variants? And if you are, do you have any estimate of you know, the effect of the rare variants on unexplained. Yeah, um, it, it's a very good question. So at the moment, you know, this is a, uh, it's a matter of sample sizes. Um, in, in current spaces, we're looking at mainly common variants. I think there's two interesting dimensions to this question. The one is leveraging information we have from other large bulk cohorts over to these more bespoke assays. If you want to go to tiny single cell subset, that's great. But you don't want to, you know, go in uh, blindly. Yeah? So I think um, reweighting, you know, independent hypothesis reweighting or other methods would be very useful. Leveraging the bulk information we have and not treating variants the same—that's one approach. Um, and the other approach, obviously, is is aggregate across rare variant effects for looking at burdens. But I think for this we need larger sample sizes. So we have now efforts in the way to do 5,000 people single cell on seek in UK biobank, and that's the scale. I think we need to really look at rare variants in any shape or form. Yeah. Oliver, thanks everyone for the question. Oh, you had a question or a reminder? The picture, that's what I was going to say. So we have um, a half an hour break. We resume here at three o'clock, but please, before you grab coffee, go to the front of the Simons Institute outside and we'll be taking a group photo. And we're back here at three o'clock for the rest of the talks. Thanks everyone. Yeah.